All right, thank you, Marco Panza, for your attention. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. I wanted to thank the organizers for doing this and for the next meeting as well. It's my first time to Brazil, and I hope that I will see you all again. It's been very nice so far. I, 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 yeah. I sing for my supper. So today I want to talk to you about a project. So this is part of a of a big project involving the interface of algebra and geometry. So this talk concerns the interface in the 19th and 20th century in the context of algebraic geometry, and then next week I'll talk about, I guess, another component of that in the 17th century, and then we can talk about how these pieces come together. So I want to begin just by noting that algebraic geometry begins with an insight that algebra and geometry are linked in the way of what we might call transfer, and that this transfer is very powerful. And just one remark along those lines from the late 17th century, or late 18th century, I'm sorry, from Lagrange, who says, as long as algebra and geometry have been separated, their progress has been slow and their usage limited, but when these two sciences are reunited, they lend each other strength and march onward together at a rapid pace toward perfection. And <clears throat> more recently, in a textbook by the algebraic geometer Karen Smith, she remarks that much of the power and rigor of algebraic geometry comes from the fact that geometric questions can be translated into purely algebraic questions, purely algebraic problems. So I want to focus on two main questions in this talk to get clearer on what exactly is going on here. Firstly, I want to say something about the nature of this transfer between algebra and geometry. And then I want to say something about the value of that transfer between algebra and geometry. Well, these are the two orienting or focal questions for the talk. So I want to begin with a few examples of this transfer so that we have an idea together about what the phenomena are. So one classical example is, of course, analytic geometry in the style of Descartes. So you, you all know this passage when Descartes writes that all points of those curves, which we may call geometric, that is, those which admit of precise and exact measurement, must bear a definite relation to all points of a straight line. And this relation must be expressed by means of a single equation. And this gives birth then, then to the Cartesian method of problem solving has two steps. One begins with an analysis, where we, we reduce a geometrical problem to an algebraic equation, or maybe several algebraic equations, and then Ultimately, finding a single equation, we geometrically construct the roots of that equation. And that's the synthetic step of the process. So it's crucial then to this problem-solving procedure that there is transfer, firstly from geometry to algebra, and then back from algebra to geometry. Another more modern example of transfer, in a sense it's not so modern, is the example that Hilbert highlights in his Foundations of Geometry, the example of transfer in the context of projective geometry. So, for instance, Hilbert shows that de Zarg's theorem, which I'm not going to state for you, but it's a very beautiful theorem involving triangles in the projective plane. So, Hilbert shows that that theorem holds in a projective plane, if and only if that plane can be coordinatized by a division ring, or what geometers call a skew field. And then Hilbert also shows that Pappus's theorem holds in a projective plane if and only if that plane can be coordinatized by a field, so by a slightly stronger algebraic structure. And what Hilbert does to show this is he, he says, given a projective plane, Hilbert shows you how to construct its algebra of segments, and that if this plane has this additional, these additional constraints, that is, it satisfies the Zarg's and or Pappus's theorem, then the multiplication operation in this algebra of segments will either be associative or even commutative and that gives you the ring, uh, division ring or field structure. And then the backwards direction, Hilbert also shows how you can recover the geometries from algebraic structures. So given a particular division ring, you can recover a uh, Desarkesian projective plane. So these are magnificent examples of transfer. The third example that I want to spend a little time on maybe looks a bit more forbidding from the start. So this is another result of Hilbert's called the Nostellensatz. Nostellensatz. Uh, the, the example, I can, I can read you, but this probably looks just garbled to many of you. I'll walk you through it a little bit. 
but for the time being, the super essential details are that it is an example of transfer. So in particular, the result says, this is in a more modern formulation than the one that Hilbert initially shows, but not too modern. So for K, an algebraically closed field, if we have an ideal that's a subset of the polynomial ring in n variables over that field, then the ideal of the variety of the ideal is equal to the radical of that ideal. And again, to give this in full detail, I would have to explain all these terms. I'll explain some of them in the, in the next couple of slides. But the gist of it is that as the result shows you, what you obtain is a bijection between the radical ideals of a particular polynomial ring and the algebraic subsets of, of a particular uh, field structure. And geometers are impressed with this result as an example of transfer. So from just an elementary textbook published 10 years ago or so, 15 years ago or so, time flies. The, the passage reads as follows. So they write, it's a consequence of this theorem. Any question about varieties can be rephrased as an algebraic question about radical ideals. And conversely, provided that we are working over an, algeb an algebraically closed field. This ability to pass between algebra and geometry will give us considerable power. So I quote this just to, just to make sure that you understand that I'm not making this up, that these folks take this transfer very seriously. If, if you talk to an algebraic geometer, one of the first things that they'll say if you ask them about transfer is like, yeah, it's, that's, the, that's the nature, that's the, this is the exact thing that distinguishes algebraic geometry from any other, from any other area. So let me say a little more about the Nostalansatz to give you a feeling for what's going on there, since some of the details will concern us as we go on today. So firstly, we were talking about varieties a minute ago. So a variety is just, in particular, I'm talking about affine varieties. More will need to be said about this. But the, the idea is that you're thinking of sets of solutions of systems of equations. And if you want to think of it in geometric terms, think of it as, as either an algebraic curve or maybe a surface, an algebraic surface. And a surface in particular, I mean in what we call affine space. So think of that as space that has no distinguished point at infinity or origin. And when you think about these objects as, as curves or, or surfaces, then I think that there's at least a naive sense that we're talking about geometry rather than algebra. An ideal, uh, on the other hand, more of you are, are probably more readily familiar with this. So this is just a non-empty subset of a ring that's closed under addition and under scalar multiplication by elements in the ring. And in particular, this talk in the Nostellensatz, we're concerned with ideals that are subsets of a polynomial ring. And so there again, I, I want to claim this is at least naively pretty, pretty plainly algebraic. So this is meant to just defend the principle that we are talking in the Nostellensatz about transfer between something geometric and something algebraic. The question about what exactly counts as geometric is going to haunt us throughout the talk, and so I want you to, to haunt me with that as well. I'll say some things about this as we go on, but I'm stressing it here to begin with because we might just want to wave our hands and say, well, of course, we're talking about surfaces and those are geometric. But these start to look a lot different than the geometry that we grew up with when we're drawing circles and lines on paper. These are much more, one wants to say, abstract objects. And so the, the nature of geometry shifts, but I still think we will want to say something about why this is geometry. So a little more about the Nostalensatz uh, to keep us keep ourselves with our eye on the ball. The, here's a way to explain it to non-specialists. So think of ourselves as starting with polynomials, uh, pi through pj and q, in a, in a polynomial ring. And let's just suppose K is an algebraically closed field for the sake of making things nice. So the theorem says that if we have for any A1 through AN in the field, we have such that all of the polynomials are zero, uh, implies that that Q, uh, polynomial Q is also zero uh, on, on those uh, A1 through AN. If that holds, then there's a positive integer m, and polynomials r1 through rj, so that you can write down that uh, polynomial q as a finite sum 
of products of other polynomials, including the polynomials that you started with. So I write it this way because sometimes when I wrote down the initial formulation of the Nostalensatz, it looks pretty bad when let's talk of varieties and ideals. This is really all it's saying, at least in the kind of formulation I'm showing you. And I show it you this because I want to show you that the theorem exhibits the dual role of polynomials in, in algebraic geometry. On the one hand, this first condition is a condition where it's fairly evident we're talking about functions. Polynomials are operating like functions. We're plugging in numbers into them and we're trying to see if they equal zero when we plug into them. But on the other hand, the second condition is a condition where we look at polynomials, we look at polynomials like formal expressions as just sums of other polynomials multiplied together. So we see that they have two functional roles. On the one hand, we see them as having a geometric functional role, thinking of functions as being geometric, and we see them as having a formal expressive role, and that's an algebraic role. So now, returning to the focal questions, the two questions were, what is the nature of transfer, and what is its value? So I want to I want to say that in algebraic geometry textbooks, it's very common to identify this transfer, the transfer of the Nostalensatz, as being a dictionary. And uh, so for instance, again from Karen Smith's book, she says this famous theorem is the first entry in a dictionary that will help us translate statements about geometry into the language of algebra. This is not the only example. I could show you lots and lots and lots and lots of examples of this term, dictionary. In fact, as a side historical question, I have been trying to figure out where the origin of this expression, dictionary, comes from. So far, I have a paper of Poincaré from 1882, I think, in the context of non-Euclidean geometry, but if anyone knows earlier usages in the literature of this expression, dictionary, between two areas of mathematics, I would be very interested in knowing that, if anyone ever stumbles upon such a thing. So this is, a, this is a, one of the papers in non-Euclidean geometry by Poincaré. It's, I think, theory of fusion groups or something like this. Uh, so here, this is a, a usage that nowadays has become quite standard. It's almost boilerplate in an algebraic geometry textbook. And logicians here, so I, I put on my logician hat for a moment, we have a tool to make some sense of, of translation. And the way Smith uses this word, the way that algebraic geometers use this word, it's a very syntactic notion. Of, trans, of, of translation, of transfer. We're going to translate sentences from one language to another. That's exactly what she says. Well, in logic, we have a notion of interpretability. This is a notion of Tarski, which says more or less the following. It says that, you can, you, that one theory, T, so a set of sentences, is interpretable in another theory, T star, if there's a way of translating the primitives of T into formulas of T star, so that you, you get a map induced by this translation such that if T proves a theorem phi, then T star proves a theorem phi star, where the star involves this translation. And we say that two theories are mutually, inter mutually interpretable if each interprets the other. So there are canonical examples of this that you're familiar with from, for instance, the work of, of Beltrami and Klein in representing non-Euclidean plane geometries on the surfaces of Euclidean objects. So this is the sort of thing that we do a lot in the late 19th century. And uh, the idea there is we learn how to translate the terms point and line in a non-standard fashion within Euclidean space, looking for a validation of the non-Euclidean axioms. But So I consider this a kind of early example of interpretability, but we have other more canonical examples later. For instance, uh, the axioms of groups are interpretable in the axioms of fields. Not mutually interpretable, but interpretation one direction. Also, the Piano axioms are interpretable in zermelo frankel set theory. These are sort of classical ways of just translating one language into another. Now, using this notion of interpretation, I can give a first answer to, to what the nature of transfer is in algebraic geometry. You can translate statements in algebra via this notion of mutual interpretability to statements in geometry and vice versa. So this, this is a first understanding. What are those mathematicians talking about when they talk about transfer? They're talking about this syntactic transfer using a dictionary. In particular, 
with this notion, you can translate proofs in one theory into proofs in the other, if you have two mutually interpretable theories. So literally, you can use it to translate entire proofs, sentence by sentence, from one theory to another. And so, then that leads us to a first proposal as to why this would be valuable. Value would be that if you have a statement about algebra, for instance, you can then translate it to geometry, efficiently prove it in geometry, and then transfer that proof step by step back to algebra using the dictionary. Step by step. Yeah, this is. Well, that's correct. That could happen, yeah. So that's that's true. That's true. No, in fact, the point of this part of the talk is, is to be naive about this, to say, here is one naive way to understand that, and, and this is not going to be very helpful, so we're going to have to enrich the picture. I'm just trying to take this literally for now. That's right, yeah, so, so part of this is going to hinge on how we measure simplicity. And the problem with, well, let me, let me identify two problems with it before I go into a more enriched account of what's going on here. So if you go back to the examples of Hilbert that I talked about, you can, you can read those two Hilbertian examples um, as, the, as, as theorems about interpretability. So Hilbert showed, looking at things nowadays, that the division ring axioms are mutually interpretable with parameters with the axioms for a Desargesian projective plane. And the field axioms are mutually interpretable with parameters with the axioms for Papian projective planes, so that those can be translated back and forth. But here's one problem with this kind of translation, that the lots of the canonical theories of fields, for instance, if you're just thinking about the reals or the complexes, those are complete and decidable theories. In fact, they're effectively so. So why would you bother transferring? If you already have a decision procedure on the side of, of the algebra, why would you ever transfer to geometry? What gain would there be? You could just run the decision procedure. Now, you can hit me back and say, well, decision procedures are sometimes not very easy to run, or we might seek insight. All of that's fine. The bottom line, though, is that the case of interpretation looks quite naive if we can just run a computer program and solve our problems that way. But here's another problem, and this is specific uh, when you think about the Nijnalansatz. So here, you, get a, you also get a mutual interpretability result. That may not be obvious, by the way, and I'm gonna blur since I don't have super long to talk today. You, you in fact do get, you can turn the Nostalansatz into a mutual interpretability result, and you have to do some category theory and it gets a little bit ugly, but the, what you end up getting is that you have an interpretation between theories of affine varieties and theories of algebras, which are related to the corresponding ideals, so in particular to finitely generated reduced k-algebras. It's ugly in the sake of interest of time, let's suppress that. What's important about the result is that those are not ordinarily complete or decidable theories. So the, the objection I just surveyed doesn't hold, but the problem that Marco talked about hits us, hits us right here. This is a very straightforward, it's a, just a line by line interpretation. And so if what we are thinking about is measuring the simplicity of proof by proof length, you gain nothing by transfer. Which is not to say that there might not be other ways of measuring the simplicity of proof, but we don't have a lot right now. Proof theory is still in a very early stage. So it's not like thinking about these things syntactically gives us a lot to put our, to put our fingers on. So I want to suggest that the strict syntactic reading of transfer doesn't get us very, very far. And so instead I want to try to enrich the picture. And I want to keep this talk about interpretability because as, as I read the talk of dictionaries by algebraic geometers, they mean, and Karen Smith said, we translate statements one by another. So instead, I think that if we're going to change the picture, what we're going to do is just need to recognize that the phenomena are different. There's more layers to the phenomena in the cases of algebraic geometry. So let me just distinguish a, a couple of layers. So on the one hand, when, you, when you're asking questions about a particular affine variety, so just think of a curve, in space, you also would ask a question about the ambient space in which that curve lives. 
do you think not just about the variety, but also about the space in which that curve lives? And those are two different levels for the objects. And secondly, when you talk about ideals, well, ideals in the case that we're talking about are subsets of some polynomial ring. And those are also then two different sorts of phenomena. And so you might think here that the transfer is more complex. We transfer from, from varieties to ideals. Well, that's the Nostal and Zatz. Do we tra is there a way to transfer to, from varieties to ideals and then use facts about the polynomial ring and push back? Well, that's the kind of more enriched picture I want to focus on next. So here's a second account of the nature of transfer. You start with the problem, for instance, about affine varieties. You then transfer it via the, the dictionary to a problem about ideals. You can then solve it with resources not just involving ideals, but also involving polynomial rings. And then you can transfer back using the dictionary to get a solution to your problem about varieties. And of course, you can mirror this and do it the other direction. So here's a second more a more sophisticated, I guess, sophisticated analysis of what's going on in transfer. Now, in this picture I just showed you, I didn't draw a line at the bottom. And the reason I didn't draw a line is because it would be bad if I drew a line. Why? Because then the same kinds of trivialization worries that I just talked about would haunt us again. But it turns out that there is no mutual interpretation between those two levels. And, and the argument that you can see pretty easily. So if there were an interpretation between, uh, suppose that the complete theory of the complexes interprets the complete theory of those polynomial rings, suppose you had that, for example, then since the complete theory of, of C to the N is decidable, you would then uh, have that the theory of polynomial rings over C is decidable, but that's false because it contradicts a theorem of Deneff involving Hilbert's 10th problem. So in fact, you don't need anything. That's, that's a pretty high level way to answer that question. Something weaker will do. But the bottom line is that we, we have a theorem where you don't in fact need, you don't, there is no interpretation between that. So the picture I drew, I can put a little X there to show you that there is no dictionary transfer between affine end space and uh, the polynomial rings. No. I don't know what else should I use. Like a death mark or something, a skull. I'll work on that. So, <laughs> a monster. There's a nice monster in our hotel here, the kind of a dragon face. Maybe I'll try to put that on my on my ex. So that's that's one problem solved, but there's another problem, maybe a deeper problem that's uh, involved in this enriched picture. So and this is the question about geometricity that I mentioned earlier. So I, I took it for granted that affine varieties are geometric, and, and I take it that's nobody's going to hit me that hard about that. And they're just curves. What could be more geometric than that? Uh, and same thing about ideals. They're just these are just polynomials, uh, or they're they're a kind of structure, I guess you could say. Uh, these are clearly algebraic. But then, but think about affine end space. Why do we want to concede that that's geometric? The way I've been talking about affine end spaces is a field structure. The definable sets are, are just literally polynomial equations and inequations. And polynomials seem plainly algebraic. So aren't I just begging the question by talking about affine end space? I mean, aren't we just building transfer in? Well, I think that we need to think about the setting of algebraic geometry in order to answer that question. So I go back to a classical text a text by Cayley, a speech he gave to the British Association for the Advancement of Science in 1883. So Cayley there writes, in geometry it is the curve, whether defined by means of its equation or in any other manner, which is the subject of contemplation and study. So I, I, I follow Cayley. Geometry is the study of curves. What are curves? Let's ask Cayley again. He tells us in his nice article on curves in the Encyclopedia Britannica, 1878, a curve is a line or continuous singly infinite system of points, in particular those described according to a law. So they are law-like regularities in space, lawful regularities in space. These are the subject matter of geometry, regularities in space defined by a law. 
describable by a law. And so, as it turns out, mathematicians chose, for various reasons, those regularities which are expressible by algebraic equations. There are lots of other regularities in space we could have settled on, but those are the ones that we did settle on, at least as a chief subject matter of mathematics for the last, I don't know, 2,000 plus years. Now, one thing that, I, that, that you might, again, try to hit me on is the fact that we're talking about complex curves here. I was talking about affine space. This is defined over the complex numbers. And that might give you other reasons then to worry that I'm, what, I, what, I, what do I mean? Why is this what's geometry? Geometry consists of imaginary points? What a strange thing to think. I mean, for one thing, doesn't geometry primarily concern what is visualizable? And your definition doesn't allow that. How do you visualize complex curves, complex varieties? And then secondly, are we somehow begging the question by just building in transfer by talking about the algebraic curves? Well, let me try to address both of those questions very briefly. And the first question about visualization, just notice that you get the same problem when you think about real algebraic geometry. It's a question of dimensionality. You want to say to me, how do you visualize a complex curve? I want to say to you, how do you visualize a curve in R8? Is that pretty easy to do? I have a hard time even in R3, but jack up the level to R8, and I have no hope at all. So the problem here, I want to say, not just that, that somehow we're talking about complex space where these curves live. The problem, the problem of dimensionality, just visualization is hard, period. And so I want to say that the non-visualizability of curves in affine space is a, meta, it's a matter of degree, not a matter of the nature of the, of the space that it consists of ideal points. Uh, a second quick argument on the, on the second point, the uh, concern that we were begging the question by just building in transfer by settling on the regularities describable by algebraic equations. So notice that when Descartes gives us this regularity, when he tells us these are the curves to settle on, he, he gave extensionally equivalent criteria of geometricity. On the one hand, he told us that we were to specify curves by definable, by curves that were defined by equations. But extensionally, this is equivalent to these curves which are constructible by a class of instruments of the sort that he believed would be admissible to the ancient geometers. So, what this indicates is that for, for geometry, uh, for Descartes at least, the curves that were primarily interesting to the ancients uh, were regularities that Descartes believed continued to be the regularities we study in modern geometry. We just admit some more regularities which are of the same type as those regularities settled on by the Greeks. So whatever reasons Descartes says, he says in fact, I've identified the reason why the Greeks settled on circles and lines by curves that are constructible by straight edge and compass. And I'm just adding instruments that have the same epistemic power. So you folks are just fine to admit these extra curves. Next. Sorry? Next. Oh dear. Thank you very much. All right, we'll have an extra long coffee break tomorrow during Marco Ponce's talk. Thank you very much, Marco. Everyone here will give you a round of applause. So I just tried to tell you a story about the nature of transfer on this more enriched story. Let me say a few words about the value of this transfer. So uh, here I want to resort to quotes from mathematicians, the easy way out for any scoundrel like me. So uh, for instance, uh, I want to give you three quotes that I think are indicative of the kind of value I want to talk about. So we have this passage from Collar from the recent Princeton Companion to Mathematics in his article on algebraic geometry, he says that, talking about an example, the simple example encapsulates the method of algebraic geometry. A geometric problem is translated into algebra where it is readily solvable. Conversely, we get insight into algebra problems by using geometry. It is hard to guess the solutions of systems of polynomial equations, but once a corresponding geometric picture is drawn, we start to have a qualitative understanding of them. The precise quantitative answer is then provided by algebra. All right, that's nice. I'll say a little more about that in a couple of slides. Uh, here's a, another passage purporting to give some value to transfer. This is from Kendig's text in 77. So he writes that this chapter, the concept of dimension, provides a nice example of how one can shift from the purely geometric visual notion 
to a purely algebraic notion. The algebraic form can then be used in settings far removed from the limited range of the visual definition, and the algebraic form can provide a more geometric way of looking at areas formerly thought to have little geometric content. I'll address that also in the slide. So finally, one more battery of quotes. These are from Gower's introductory essay to the Princeton Companion of Mathematics. So he writes, it is often possible to translate a piece of mathematics from algebra into geometry or vice versa. Nevertheless, there is a definite difference between algebra and geometric methods of thinking, one more symbolic and one more pictorial. And this can have a profound influence on the subjects that mathematicians choose to pursue. And then it goes on. If you look at a typical research paper in geometry, will it be full of pictures? Disappointingly, no. In fact, the methods used to solve geometric problems very often involve a great deal of symbolic manipulation. Although good powers of visualization may be needed to find and use these methods, and pictures will typically underlie what is going on. As for algebra, is it mere symbolic manipulation? Not at all. Very often, one solves an algebraic problem by finding a way to visualize it. And then he sums up. It turns out that a good way of solving many geometrical problems is to convert them into algebra. Mathematicians vary widely in their ability and willingness to follow an argument like that one. If you cannot visualize it well enough to see that it is definitely correct, then you may prefer an algebraic approach. So let's try to summarize what these passages were indicating. So Kolar says that different and complementary types of understanding are afforded by each mode of reasoning, and if we allow, if we have transfer, then we can gain the benefits of both sides. Uh, Kendig indicates that particular geometrical reasoning is tied to visualization, but that we can pass from geometry to algebra and extend our geometric reasoning, our visualizable powers, in non-visualizable settings. And this is not only the case in algebraic geometry, this is also what happens in arithmetic geometry. And lastly, Gowers indicates that, that mathematicians have different abilities. Some are more visual, some are not. If we have transfer, then mathematicians can work on problems using whichever means they find the most amenable to, their, to themselves, the most optimal for themselves. So these views have in common that they explain the value of transfer in terms of our ability to reason providing two different modes of representing what is at least ostensibly the same content, the content of algebraic geometry. So what, what do I think this, this provides for? How can, I, how can I synthesize those different accounts? Well, I have this a theory of what I call roadblocks. So sometimes a mathematician will just have difficulty thinking algebraically, or different difficulty thinking geometrically. And there might be cognitive reasons why. Maybe some of us are just not built to be visualizable, to be visualizers. Maybe some of us are more naturally combinatorial. This kind of talk had, sinister, in a sinister way, racist implications in the writings of Felix Klein at the end of the 19th century, as many of you are aware of. Nevertheless, this may still be the case, uh, that there are just some people who just aren't built to visualize things. It also might just be that in some cases it's too complex to use geometry or algebra, and that there's a value then in transferring just to avoid the complexity. And I'll address that in my talk uh, at the next meeting here. And uh, it might even be that there are some results that are impossible to prove without transfer. So, uh, so this account then of the value of transfer that, I, that I'm finishing with is that it allows us to avoid roadblocks. And, and, I, and I read this, uh, I was inspired in a letter that Andre Vey wrote to his sister in 1940 on this view, where he's describing to his sister, it's a, light, it's a little different context, he's talking about the, uh, the transferring between talking of function fields, the algebra of Dedekind Weber, and talking about the, the Riemannian way of doing things. And uh, Vey writes that between these, the distance is not so large that a patient study would not teach us the art of passing from one to the other, and to profit in the study of the first from knowledge acquired about the second, and of the extremely powerful means afforded to us in the study of the latter. That is not to say that at best all will be easy, but one ends up by learning to see something there, although it is still somewhat confused. And, and he indicates then that one would be totally obstructed if there were not a bridge between the two. 
and he describes his work as being the identifying a Rosetta Stone for mathematics, in particular for the three great areas of arithmetic, algebra, and geometry. Now, this is what the mathematician is constantly involved in constructing so as to avoid the kind of roadblocks that happen when you only know one way of thinking. If you can transfer, then you can avoid problems. If the geometry isn't working, then you go to algebra. This is the, this is the proposal that I'm working with here. I'm not trying to claim that this is the only answer to why transfer is valuable, but I'm giving you a story about value of transfer. So let me, the, the last slide then just points out that one benefit of the account that I'm giving here is that it takes the dictionary talk that algebraic geometers seem to love so much, it takes it very seriously. And I think a way to understand my second account here today is, is, is just to note by analogy that when you have a dictionary, not just in the case of mathematics, but even the case of languages, you, you need some background in the languages at issue in order to use a dictionary well. For instance, it's hard to translate from Portuguese into English if you don't know any Portuguese. I mean, you might think you can sort of do it, just go word by word, but it doesn't usually work. You know, go play with your Google Translate if you want and see what kind of, you know, see what kind of translations you get. It typically does not look very good. And the problem that those automated systems have that, that we don't have is that we can acquire background knowledge about how to use the languages. Not just vocabulary, but also grammar. And I think you can understand my second enriched account as being an account that has this background view. Because not only do you know the dictionary between talking about varieties and ideals, you also have facts about how those ideals live in an, uh, in a, in an ambient uh, polynomial ring, about how these varieties live in an ambient space. And so those, those, those are the analogy then of the kind of background knowledge that we need in natural language to use a dictionary well. All right, and that's all she wrote. <laughs>